All right. Thank you. So, welcome everyone to Converge. Uh, I am here to give you a harsh reality. I am here to shine a light, to cast away the shadows, to strip away those uh, uh, constructs that you hide behind and tell you the cold, harsh truth that you make bad decisions. It's true. You make bad decisions. You drink too much, you smoke too much, you party too much. You make bad decisions. After the party, you combine all the clear alcohol into one bottle and you drink it straight. Really bad decisions. Okay, that's a true story, by the way. But I am not here to tell you about good decisions because for God's sakes, I'm wearing pink socks with marlins on them and a blue and white checkered top. I may not be qualified to tell you what a good decision is. Am I a creative genius or am I a fashion faux pas? I'm sure you're split down the middle on that, right? Decision making to me is a fascinating, fascinating thing. There's a psychology around decision making and our decisions rule our lives. Everything we do has impact. Every day you face a crossroads and at that crossroads you can make a good decision or you can make a bad decision. And invariably, every one of us in this room is gonna choose the bad decision. But I'm gonna fast forward a little bit because I don't wanna talk about what makes a bad decision. I don't want to talk about what makes a good decision. What I want to talk about is I want to talk about what you do after you make that decision because you will have to do it. Our lives are fraught with change. They're fraught with risk and in that we have to make our decisions and we have to move forward with those decisions. So I'm hoping I'm going to give you maybe a few tools and maybe a few things that's going to help you with what those decisions are in moving forward. The title of this talk, for instance, initially was, You Make Bad Decisions and You Should Feel Bad. And then I thought about that and I said, wow, that makes me feel bad. And I don't want to feel bad and I don't want you make, to make you feel bad. So I changed the title to, You Make Bad Decisions, Should You Feel Bad? And I think in context, the answer is, no, you shouldn't. Because what I've discovered in my very small time on this giant rock is that you can make bad decisions and you can still be effective. You can make bad decisions and you can become President of the United States. It's true, right? It's true. That's not a political comment, that's a statement of fact, right? You can, it is entirely possible. So you can still be effective even though you make bad decisions. And the whole thing, when it comes to InfoSec and when it comes to decision making, is it's really all based around risk. So at the end of the day, we are all risk managers. Every one of us is a risk manager. Right? So let me tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Joel Cardella. I work for a company called Rapid7. I'm a security consultant. And I go and I talk to a lot of people. And what's fascinating to me is the answer I get back when I ask this one question, and that is, how do you make your security decisions? And I'll get back things like, we've always done it this way. Or, I was told to do this. Or, that's what the compliance framework says I'm supposed to do. Right? Sometimes I'll even get back, well, that's our best practice. But that still doesn't tell me what it is I'm trying to find out. And that is, how are you making that decision? What's driving the decision? What are you using to determine? What are your determining factors, right? And this is all psychology. And I'm looking at it from the psychological angle and going, I want to get into your head and understand why you make these decisions. Because at the end of the day, as a risk manager, you are making these decisions, hopefully, to reduce your risk. Right? At the end of the day, that's what we're looking to do, working in the field that we're working in. I have a very loud voice, so I'm going to move that down a little bit. <clears throat> so there are a number of things that you can do once you have your decision to, to execute with that decision. And you may be called on to defend your decision. Or you may be called on even to justify your decision. Right? Madonna, justify. Anybody know this album? I see some of you in this room. You're at least as old as I am. We remember justify, right? Justification is an interesting psychological phenomenon. When we justify a decision, we don't always speak from a place that is a factual place. We sometimes speak from a place that is an emotional place, which is not really where we want to be. And if we look at the psychology of justification just a little bit, we can understand it a little better. So this is an experiment that was done on justification. These are two paintings by a famous artist called Piet Mondrian. Right? And you may have seen some of his work. Uh, he's most famous for the white square. Right? Artist, white square. So the people were, were told, here are your two paintings. And we want you to tell us. The first group was said, we want you to pick the painting that you like best. 
So if I asked you to pick the painting that you like best, the study says the majority of you are going to choose this one. Now, the second group was told, we want you to pick the painting you like best, but tell us why that you like it best. Invariably, that second group chose this painting. Because it turns out, when it comes to justification, these concepts, which are not like the abstract concepts, are easier for us to justify. And it really comes down to that in the InfoSec world, too. When we are asked to justify something that is an abstract, that is not an absolute, we have a very difficult time doing it. So that's just human psychology, right? Very interesting. Um, a third group, by the way, was told to, um, they were told to, it was the reverse, they were told to pick their favorite, pick their favorite but not tell why. I can't quite know what it was, but it wound up flipping the other way as well. So we tend to fall to the abstract when we're not called out on the carpet to justify what it is we need to do. But when we are, then we, we stick to the concrete and what we can understand. So think about that in InfoSec terms. Like when we are trying to deal with a problem in the world of InfoSec, and we have good data on that problem, it's very easy for us to justify and make those decisions. But when we go in a little bit blind, or when we don't have quite enough data around the problem that we're dealing with, it's a lot harder to justify, right? Think about building a business case. So one of the things that I did in the former life is I was a CISO, and I had to build business cases. And sometimes I had to build business cases around abstracts. That was really, really hard, right? How do I quantify what it is I need to do in business terms so the management understands it and will fund what it is I'm asking them to fund. Versus, hey, I got this pen test and it shows all these really bad problems. I need to, to buy a bunch of stuff so we can defend against it. Oh, okay, no problem. Here, I'll write you a check. Right? This happens all the time. But the world we're living in today, we have to deal more with that abstract. We have to try to figure out, in a proactive sense, what it is we can do before it's actually a problem. And this is, this is the, what we fight with. So we're not only fighting in InfoSec, we're fighting with the psychology of ourselves and trying to deal with what the abstract is when it comes to justification. So this is a hierarchy of knowledge. And basically what, what we say in psycho psychology is when I'm dealing with things, right? If I'm dealing with the top of the pyramid, which is where knowledge sits, I'm far better equipped to justify the decisions I make when I have knowledge. Right? And as we go down the hierarchy, it becomes harder and harder and harder to justify. So gut instinct. You may be somebody who's very, very intuitive, but it's really hard to justify your decisions just based on intuition. I would not dissuade you from making your decisions on intuition. I would say, follow your intuition. It's very good. Usually, it's guiding you in the right way. Or if it's telling you, don't do this, don't do that. Right? That's usually the case. After gut instinct, we have data. And we hear a lot about this. Well, I have data that shows it. Data by itself, though, in its raw form, doesn't really help us. Until that data is organized and normalized into something we can understand, like information, now we get to the point where we can really start justifying what our decisions are based on information. And then again, if we turn that information into actual knowledge, where we can show a, a, a cycle or show an event as a result of it, now we really can get to the point where we can justify those decisions. And I say that from a standpoint of we feel good about ourselves justifying what those decisions are. right? So when you justify, there's just a few things I want you to think about. First of all, don't use self-justification. Self-justification is a psychological state, right? It basically is a, a, a thing called dissonance. When you're in dissonance, um, you are trying to justify a conclusion so you can reach the end that you want to, to get to when you're self-justifying. And that's, that's a state that you don't want to be in, right? So don't use self-justification like, well, I don't have to buy this iPad because I don't need this iPad, but if I do buy it, well, I'll read my email more, right? Or I'll, I'll surf the web more. Not that you need to do that, right? But those are self-justification things. Second thing with justify is don't flee reality. Very often, when we're justifying, we're in a state, again, it's an emotional state, and we're kind of speaking from being painted into a corner. And so it's very, very difficult not to leave the reality of what's going on. Because again, I'm trying to frame this for you in terms of how you would do business, what you would do in an enterprise, what you would do in InfoSec. You don't want to flee the reality. You don't want to go into a space where you know, things aren't real, right? Which kind of feeds into the other one, which is use positive narr narratives. Don't use fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt are our enemy. Absolutely. They used to be every single thing that InfoSec was based on in the early days. That is no longer true. In fact, fear, uncertainty, and doubt is our enemy now, right? It is the enemy, and it is us, 
So we have to change this. If we're going to change the perception of what we are to the outside world, we've got to get rid of fear, uncertainty, and doubt and start using positive narratives in the things we're doing. Now keep in mind, a positive narrative doesn't have to be rosy and nice, right? A positive narrative can be very uh, apocalyptic. But as long as it's describing things in real terms in a positive way, this is how bad it is, this is how we're going to get better, those are good things. That's what I do for a living. I walk into clients and I tell them how ugly their baby is. And they pay me to do that. And then I walk away and never have to see them again. There may not be a better job on this planet, right? But I use positive narratives to go, okay, look, your baby's ugly. And maybe you know your baby's ugly and that's fine. What is it we can do to, to fix this, to help this, to move it along so you are better at what you do. Because in my mind, I don't want them just to fix things because compliance tells them to fix them. I want them to get better, right? I want them to be healthy. I want them to make good decisions and good choices. Nonverbal matters. When you are justifying a decision, especially in person, nonverbal matters. But I'll tell you this, it matters on the phone too. Believe it or not, if you're speaking on the phone and people can't see your face, but you are making faces or you are, you know, doing this, that actually plays. That those nonverbal cues will come through in your voice and people pick up on them. Nonverbal is something that's, that's pretty spectacular and there's an entire discipline and a psychology around it. And if you ever get the chance to study it, you should, because this can make the difference between you totally buying into something or totally rejecting something. Nonverbal is very, very important. Um, look for other influencers. If there are people who have influence, who are saying the same things you are doing, when you are justifying a decision, you can use them to say, this is what they did, we're basing our decision off of what they did. That's a good thing. This is how we have things like common frameworks and community standards, the CIS critical controls, right? Things like this matter because they have a loud voice and they allow us to use as an influential tool uh, in our justification with our decisions. And then use questions carefully because here's the thing about questions. If I'm in a justification mode and I'm trying to say, I need to justify what I've proposed to you because I need you to write me a check. If it comes back to me and I start asking you questions and challenging you and putting you on the defensive, that dynamic has completely changed. And your justification case now breaks down and very, very likely you're not going to be able to fully justify what it is you're trying to do. So when you're justifying, okay, not defending, which we're going to talk about next, but when you're justifying, you want to very, very, very carefully use questions and you only want to use questions probatively to say, I don't think I quite understand what you asked me. Can you ask me that again? Or if I understand what you're saying, it's this. Can you, can you val verify that that's what you're saying? Right? Very, very careful with questions. Don't challenge people when you're in justification mode because it's not going to work out for you. They're going to wind up being on the defensive and then it's bad. And then when you actually decide something, when it comes to justification, this is the answer that I'm looking for when I ask the clients, tell me how you make security decisions. I want to know your set of decision-making principles. What are they? They could be very, very simple. They could be something like, we make decisions based on the current threat landscape. That's a fine justification, right? Maybe it's a little vague. Maybe we need to tease that out a little. Maybe we need to, to formulate it into something we can understand. But it's a justification, and it's valid, and it works. But you need this defining set of decision-making principles in order to do it. So I don't care what level you're at. I don't care if you're a CEO. I don't care if you are just starting out in InfoSec, you need your decision-making principles so you can rely on them. So when people ask you, how did you arrive at this conclusion or why did you decide this? You can immediately tie it back to, this is the criteria I based it on, right? And again, maybe you made the wrong decision. Maybe it was a bad decision, but it's fully justified because it's within your set of decision-making principles. That's a really important thing. And write it down. For God's sakes, write it down. It's the one thing that I have with every single client I do, and that is the first thing I'm going to tell you is write it down. You don't have enough written down. Because believe it or not, that matters. When you write it down, it matters. It took me a long time to learn that lesson. A long time. But writing it down matters. Tie your decisions to your principles. Just make sure you have a very logical way of saying, this is how I arrived at this conclusion, right or wrong. I guarantee you, you'll have champions if you can do this. There are people who will believe you, who will be on your side, even if the decision is the wrong decision. They'll say, I completely understand why you did that. There's a factor you didn't consider. Then you take that factor, you put it back into your decision-making principles framework, and if there's something missing, then we, we put another decision-making principle in there. So maybe our second principle, besides we base it on the current threat landscape, is we look at what our business is doing, and we determine whether or not that threat is a valid threat for our business. Because if I run a business that's completely online, right, I'm completely cloud-based, I have two or three employees, 
why am I going to worry about flooding and earthquakes or disaster recovery? That doesn't make sense. Why would I do that? Right? You can't justify that. So even though the best practices say, well, you need to be worry about flooding and earthquakes, right? There may be certain criteria that don't apply to you. So you tie your decisions back to your principles. You make sure that your principles are a living document and you justify the kinds of things you make. You'll be on a lot better footing when you do that. Defend. Now let's say we have to defend our decision. You have to actually stand in front of somebody and, and do this. Uh, any, uh, any, uh, uh, ABD candidates in here working on their PhDs? Right? You, you know about this. If you, if you're ever pursuing an advanced degree, you have to defend your thesis. Right? And sometimes it's very difficult to defend your thesis because you get crazy questions that you never anticipated. But that's okay. Right? Justifying is one thing. This is how I made this decision. Defense is another. This is why this is a good decision or a bad decision. Right? Sometimes you need to defend bad decisions. It's true. Right? So when you're mounting a spirited defense, now, unfortunately, I don't have attribution for this, and I wish I did, but I came across, across a really interesting blog by somebody who's a UX designer, and they put together a bunch of stuff on how they defend against questions in, in the design world. And I looked at it, and I was like, wow, this is really, really interesting, because it, it maps directly back to the kinds of things that we have in InfoSec, even though it's kind of a different discipline. So the first one he had there, he said, stay calm, stay calm. I added, but attentive. Because here's the problem with calm. Calm is great. When you're calm defending your decision, right? you don't have emotion that's, that's guiding you, and everything is good. The problem is, if you're too calm, you're seen as passive aggressive. right? And if you're passively aggressive, the conversation turns and things go bad. So calm but attentive. Uh, everybody familiar with active listening? This is, let me show you what active listening is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's all you have to do. That's your active listening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So stay calm, but be attentive. Show the, the, the speaker that you're hearing what they're saying and that you possibly even understand it. Remind anyone questioning the results that you went through a process to get there. And then the question is, you did go through a process to get there, right? Because that goes back to writing it down. Did you have a process? What's your decision-making process? Is it just based on your core principles? Or maybe you were like, hey, I talked to a vendor, and the vendor said this, and I looked into what they said, and yeah, it's true. And so now we come to this, this kind of thing that we have to deal with based on some information that I gather, right? And if that's your process, that's fine. But tell them, we did go through a process. This wasn't just plucked out of the air or other places, right? Recall all the work, feedback, and rounds of iterations you went through in the current design being called into question. Now, in a design world, this is true. We have an iterative process. If you're in development or design, you're familiar with iteration. In InfoSec, we don't always get iteration. Sometimes we get a big bang. We get it one time and that's it. But we should be iterative, especially with things like vulnerability management. Vulnerability management is an iterative process, right? And if we are controlling risk in an organization using vulnerability management, we want to remind them that this is an ongoing process. We keep looking at this over and over and over, and we're not just one and done, right? This is an important thing. But again, if we can show we have rigor, right? We have an approach that that is iterative, and we have an approach where we've looked at this problem over and over and over again, people are going to tend to believe you more. It is a valid defense to say we have a lot of iteration that goes into this. Challenge the challenger. If there's no user base and bank of usage statistics, then all question is driven by opinion. Absolutely true. True in the design world, true in the infosec world. Right? I used to have a boss who used to challenge me, and he would challenge me based on pure opinion. And he would ask me crazy questions like, are we secure? Uh, no, <laughs> right? <laughs> How do I answer that, right? Um, in the absence of data, questioning is speculative. Very, very, very important to understand that. In the absence of data, questioning is speculative. So if somebody comes to you and, and you are trying to defend a decision that you made in InfoSec, find out where they are coming from. <laughs> Ask those questions. What told you that? Oh, I, you know, I went to a Gartner conference and they told me. Great, right? So I'll have to do some research and get back to you, right? That happens a lot. Site analytic data, site feedback or lack thereof, right? That, that sometimes is, is in your favor when you're defending. If you, there is no feedback available, you can go, look, there was nothing. I couldn't find anything. We might have just to take a shot in the dark at this, right? We just might have to try it and see if it works. And if it does, that's fantastic. And if it doesn't, I guess we'll try something else. That's the best we can do. And then story wins. Absolutely true. I don't care what discipline you work in. I don't care if you're in IT. I don't care if you're in finance. I don't care if you're an artist. I don't care if you're a construction worker. Storytelling wins. 
This is the absolute truth. Become a storyteller. Know your story. Be able to tell your story. Because when you tell your story iteratively over and over and over, people will believe your story, which is only the first step. Once they believe your story, you want them to become part of your story. Once they're part of your story, they're bought in and you're good to go. Storytelling is key. We have been doing this as a human uh, construct for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. This goes back to our, our ancestors far enough that we can't even trace them. Storytelling wins every time, right? Sometimes you just have to find the right audience for the story or find the right story, but that's different than the story itself, or uh, different than storytelling itself. Use storytelling to your benefit. And then in the face of contrary proof of success or failure, don't be afraid to change your mind, right? Defense of a position doesn't necessarily mean that you win. Defense of a position says, hmm, you know, I'm defending this, but I realize what you're saying, so I think that maybe there's a solution here that benefits both of us. This is the whole win-win philosophy, right? Sometimes you do need to change your mind when you're defending your position, and that doesn't mean giving in. What that means is, I've come to a realization, something that I hadn't occurred, that occurred to me before, you helped me get there, thank you, let's move forward with this. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that at the end, to a pretty fantastic decision-making process. Anybody know who this is? So this is Bob Graham, who is a senator from Florida. Um, I think he was the governor for a while, then he was a senator, he's retired now. Bob Graham is very, very famous because since 1977, Bob Graham has, every single day of his life, literally every hour of his life, written down in a little notebook everything that happened to him. He wrote down his weight. He wrote down what he did that day. He wrote down the rooms he was in that day when he was in the Senate. And he became known for somebody who was very meticulously documenting. If you go to the Florida Museum, um, I. I can't remember what it is, it's probably Tallahassee, which is where the capital is. Um, his notebooks are on display, over 4,000 notebooks. Each notebook is two to three days worth of what happened in the guy's life. How many people think that's fascinating? How many people would want to sit and read all that? Not many. So why is he doing it? Well, that's just his thing. But it turns out it worked to his benefit more than one time. First of all, he built a reputation. His reputation is somebody who catalogs everything down to the specific nth degree. So people knew this about him, and he, he built his reputation on it. In 2002, the CIA was uh, basically put on the hot seat for waterboarding, if you're familiar, which is a form of torture, right, to get information out of, out of um, interrogation techniques, right? And so the CIA challenged the Speaker of the House, who was Nancy Pelosi, and said, we told you, uh, they came back to the CIA and said, you didn't tell us you were doing waterboarding. And they came back and they said, no, on two different occasions, we briefed you on the waterboarding techniques that we did. And she was uh, part of the, um, the Senate committee that handled that. I can't remember which one it was. Well, it so happens that Bob Graham was also on that committee. So Bob Graham said, that's interesting. Can you tell me what two days that you briefed us on? And the CIA came back and said, yeah, these two days. Bob Graham went back to his notebooks and said, uh, no, on those two days, I was here and here, and then I was here and here. So that's impossible. You couldn't have done that. And guess what happened? CIA backed down. He said, oh, sorry, we were wrong. <laughs> wrong. Right? Yeah, we were wrong. All because, reputationally, he was somebody who wrote it down and built his reputation on the fact that he wrote things down. He was able to successfully defend against this, you know, effective defense, or he was, he was able to, to defend his position, which broke down the defense of another position because of what he was doing with his pure documentation. Right? Now, I could never document to this level, to this degree, but I take inspiration from this and I go, yeah, you know what? The more you write down, the better it is. So meeting notes, uh, like meeting minutes, they matter. They matter way more than you think. And if you have an opinion in a meeting and they are taking meeting notes, make sure it's written down. And as that goes over time and you build that case over and over and over, it becomes very, very strong. And if meeting minutes are very strong, opinions are known, decisions are made, and they're easily defended or easily deconstructed because of it, right? But very interesting. Case study. So the next thing about decisions is you need to learn to exploit opportunity. Now here's a funny thing. I was searching for, for exploitation on the internet. Don't ever do that, by the way. <laughs> and, and what I found was this graphic. 
and it was on a page in French, so I have no idea what it was saying, because I didn't translate it, because that's, you know, that's not fun, right? I'd rather like not know what's going on and have this weird graphic of, hackers are opportunistic, what about you? All right, that matters, so I put it up there, and I don't know why the guy with the megaphone is so happy about this. I have no idea, right? But it's all about opportunity, and so recognizing opportunity in decision making, it's very, very important that you recognize opportunity and you take advantage of opportunity. But it's hard, too, right? It's a very hard thing. How do we know when an opportunity presents itself? So one of my bosses used to say to me, I am very, uh, uh, he would say it this way, I will take on a very large amount of risk, which used to send me into fits, right? Because then it was my responsibility to deal with it. But as I think about it, what he was actually saying to me was, I see a lot of opportunity out there that I don't want to pass me by. Because risk and opportunity go hand in hand, right? So it's really important to understand when there is an opportunity and when you can take advantage of that opportunity to make those decisions in your favor, right? Now this is difficult because opportunity means something different to everybody. And you know, some opportunities are better than others. Should I have bought Facebook when it was $30 a share? Yes, I should have. I didn't, right? It was an opportunity that I missed. But it was also based on pure emotion. I hated Facebook and I wanted nothing to do with them. But they could have made me very wealthy, <laughs> right? So, hmm, right? What do you do about that? So it's, a, it's a difficult decision. But with opportunity, when a decision maker can take advantage of an opportunity, they can proactively reduce, reduce risks. And that was famously said by me, right? You absolutely can proactively reduce risk if you can recognize opportunity and take advantage of it in your organization. If there are opportunities to build something new, if there are opportunities to educate, if there are opportunities to, uh, to organizationally make yourself more efficient, right? Attackers take advantage of chaos. And in chaos, there is opportunity. When we reduce chaos, we reduce opportunity. If you can reduce the chaos in your organization, you are benefiting them. So the opportunity for you is the reduction of chaos, which takes away the opportunity from them. That's a really good thing. That's something you should look for. Any efficiency you can gain organizationally is going to help you in an InfoSec way. So recognizing opportunity. Number one, the first thing you have to realize is it won't be perfect. So when we look for opportunity, we're always looking for the perfect thing. We're always looking for that convergence, that, harm that harmonic convergence, where everything comes together and, oh, look, it's wonderful and, and it's really easy for us to make that, that call. But it's not always that way. So sometimes you have to take a risk. Remember, risk and opportunity go hand in hand. And you have to take that risk sometimes. It's not going to be a perfect scenario. But what happens if, right? Ask yourself those questions. The future is built with today's tools and not tomorrow's. So we don't wait for the next best big thing. I'm not waiting for Uber to make the self-driving car or Google to make the self-driving car, right? And they're not building it with, the, uh, with things that are going to be invented by Elon Musk, right? They're doing it right now. And that's an important thing to remember is if you want to affect change, and if you want to make good decisions and do things, you've got to do it with what you have today. Don't wait for something to come along to do it. Okay? Appreciate the evolution of previous failures. Look at the past. And if you are exploiting opportunity, right? If you are in a decision-making capacity going, I'm going to decide something that's really cool, use the past to teach you a lesson. What happened before and can it happen again? Will it happen again? Right? <laughs> Timing can be, usually is, everything. Sometimes people refer to timing as luck. I don't really believe in luck so much, but I believe in timing. And timing really is everything. If you act at the right time, right, uh, what is the old saying, uh, never let a good disaster go to waste, right? Timing is everything. But keep, be aware of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. That's the only thing. And, eh, never let a good disaster go to waste, but don't use it as FUD either, right? But look for it. Look for the timing. Maybe it's right. There's a right time and there's a wrong time. If somebody has a really mad look on their face, that's the wrong time. Right? Those of you who are married, you understand what I mean. <laughs> right? Intuition is real, but so is self-doubt. And so that's the thing. You can follow your intuition, but sometimes you don't trust your intuition. And here's what I'll say. I trust my intuition to a great degree, but I don't let it rule me. I let it become a factor in the decisions that I make. And I say, you know, my gut's telling me this is what I should do. Maybe I need more data. Maybe I need to, to change that data into information. Maybe I need to change that information into knowledge. Or maybe I'm okay with my, what my gut is telling me and I'm going to ride the wave. For most of my life, most of my career, this has worked out for me. I have taken some risks. I took a risk becoming a consultant in a, in a crazy little company that was just building out a consulting practice. But it was a good risk and I'm happy I took it, right? So you can take those risks too. Look for them. 
right? Think about what your intuition is telling you, and if it's, if it's really telling you not to do it, believe it. Or at least consider that as a factor and say, why would it tell me not to do that? Just you can't confuse intuition with self-doubt. Self-doubt is, I don't think I can do this. Your intuition says, wow, this is a really good opportunity. And then you go, yeah, but I don't think I can do it. Two different worlds that are conflicting there. Which one do you pick? Right? That's up to you. But use it as a factor in making decisions. It will help you. And when it goes bad, it can really go bad. And at that point, when it comes to decision making, you have what you have, you get what you get, and you kind of have to just deal with it in, in any way you can. I would love that quote. I have kleptomania, but when it gets bad, I take something out of it. That's great. All right, good stuff. So I'm going to tell you about three situations where things got really, really bad, and there was really nothing they could do about it. The first is Kodak. So Kodak is a company that was formed in 1880 and for a hundred years ruled photography. And when I say ruled, I'm not kidding. Those of you who are old enough probably recognize this symbol being in every parking lot around the US at, with Kodak photomat booths, right? These were booths that were set up in parking lots where you could take your film, drive up to the booth, drop it uh, off at the photomat, they would develop the film, and then you would come back five or six days later, whatever it was, and pick up your, your prints that were produced from your film. They were everywhere, thousands and thousands of these things. What a lot of people don't know is that right in the 1970s, Kodak invented digital photography. They invented digital photography, and the business they were going to do is they said, you know, we, we think that there's, there's a use for this, but we're not sure, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to go out to cruise ships. We're going to take pictures of people on cruise ships and give them their pictures as they're leaving the ship, and that'll be an awesome business opportunity for us. But it didn't work out. People weren't that impressed with it. So the managers at Kodak abandoned it. They sold off the technology. They didn't even have a patent for it. Sold off the technology for CCD, um, making CCDs for digital photography, and the rest is history. They were so focused on their film developing business line, which was incredibly lucrative, that they lost sight of innovation. And they lost sight of where that could take them in the next level. So Kodak today is actually still in business. Um, it's not the business it used to be. They make films for Hollywood, uh, like film for Hollywood that, that Hollywood uses in their, in their cameras. Um, and uh, they, do, uh, they do some other stuff too, but they, they abandon digital photography altogether, right? Pretty bad. Kmart. So Kmart decided to compete with this new company called Walmart. And what they wanted to do is they were going to compete on price. So they said, you know what, whatever Walmart prices their products at, we're going to price our products at too. Which was fine, except that Walmart had a leg up. Walmart had an inventory system that was a just-in-time inventory system, which means if you buy a product off my shelf today, my inventory automatically updates and gets me that product by tomorrow so it's back on the shelf. Kmart did not invest in this. So Kmart had customers coming to them where shelves were empty. The customers got frustrated and they walked away. Kmart was eventually sold to Sears, which is another tragedy, right? They combined with Sears, Sears was completely mismanaged, and now they're closing Kmarts and Sears all over the country. And this used to be a major, major force in the world. Kmart was widely recognized, widely known. Motorola. Motorola decided, what? Who's ever going to use a smartphone? That doesn't make sense. People don't want their phones to be smart, they want them to make telephone calls. Right? And the rest is history. I don't think I have to say anything more. But three very significant forces in the world that made very bad decisions from which they really couldn't come out from under it. And you could be in the same position. You could be in a position where you have a really bad decision or you're part of a really bad decision. Uh, for instance, I worked for WorldCom. Those of you who remember WorldCom, right? It wasn't a bad decision to work for WorldCom, but they certainly made bad decisions that kept me, you know, uh, made me a part of what their bad decisions were. Um, filing the largest bankruptcy in history in the 2000s. Um, you might not have recourse. You might not be able to do anything about it. That doesn't mean you're defenseless, okay? Again, you're looking for opportunity. You're looking to, to do the best you can with what you have. But sometimes recognize that bad decisions are bad. And when they go bad, they're bad. It's like rotten fruit. You are not gonna eat it, right? So don't eat it. If you're in that situation today and all you have in front of you is rotten fruit, we need to find a different store for you to shop at. That's what I'm saying. Okay, so good decision, bad decision. 
I'm a very visual guy, and I, in a visual way, want to talk to you about what makes a good decision and what makes a bad decision. So consider this. This is 1968. Look at my notes. <clears throat> 1967. This is Sweden. What this is, is Sweden, which is uh, a country that's near Norway and Finland, was driving on the left-hand side. And Norway and Finland were driving on the right-hand side. And Sweden said, you know what? We are going to drive on the right-hand side because it only makes sense uh, in the Netherlands for everybody to be on the same side of the road. They also wanted to reduce accidents, things like this. When they took a survey, 83% of the population was against this change. right? But they went ahead and did it anyway. So in 1967, at 4.50 AM, with a crowd of onlookers, they went out into the field and they had all the traffic stop. And this is what it looks like. When I talk about change management, this is my change management slide. Right? <laughs> and they go, does your change management look like this? It probably does. But here's the interesting thing. 10 minutes later, at 5 AM, they announced Sweden is now driving on the right-hand side. And the picture I don't have is to show you the very easy flow of traffic where people switch from one side to the other. But think about what they had to do to get them to drive on the left-hand side. Street signs, street lights, bus stops, all had to be changed in order for them to prepare for this. This is a massive, massive, massive effort that we kind of see the middle of here, but there's an end that's a happy ending. Right? Everything was fine 10 minutes later. So remember that. When you're in the midst of something that feels or looks like this, there's an end in sight, and it could be a happy ending. And your decisions could actually influence what that end ending is. Here's one. So this is a, a, we'll say a cage. It's a cage that is used on high rises so children can take advantage of the outside. So if you're living in a high rise in New York in the 30s or 40s and your kid needs air, you can put them out on the balcony like this. And of course, they're, they're fully protected. Everything is fine. You know, there's even some padding here so they're not hurt by the cage. Uh, I just wonder what went into this and what people thought about it. I also wonder where the photographer is when he took this picture. And hopefully he's right next door. But, you know, would you, would you today put your baby out in a cage on a thing. That's, that's a pretty big risk, right? Like, what decisions went into this? Again, the psychology of this is fascinating to me. So, you know, how does this work? I'm not really sure. Here is the very first test of a bulletproof vest. <laughs> I want you to consider this. What's in this guy's mind and what's in that guy's mind? <laughs> right? Now, if you're in this situation, are you this guy or are you that guy? That's what you have to decide. And then from there, do I defend, do I justify, do I exploit, or do I run the hell away? <laughs> right? These are your choices. But very interesting. Very interesting. These are the risks that they took. They said, OK, we're going to try this out in a person. Now, I imagine they did some testing before this, I hope. right? But I've seen stuff today where we see products go to market that don't go through any testing that looks like this whatsoever. Right? And all of a sudden, they're riddled with security holes, and, and we have IoT, and you know, terrible things happen. So this is my risk management slide. As you can see, this man is wearing rocket-powered roller skates. On his back is a fuel tank that is being filled by leaded fuel. He's obviously a businessman, as we can see by the briefcase in his hand. The question you have to ask yourself is, is this an example of really bad risk management? Or is this an example of really awesome risk acceptance? It really depends on what side of the aisle you're on. Okay? Here's the thing with InfoSec. If we look at something like this, we immediately start to sweat and go, oh, 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 this is a really bad idea. Or we think that's really cool and I want to try that. Right? Well, one of those. One of those happens. Either way, either way, you have to go, okay, so what can I do to help this? Because what you can't do in InfoSec is you can't say, you can't do that. That's really bad, right? You can say that's really bad, but you can't say you can't do that. Don't ever be the department of no. That's the old InfoSec, not the new InfoSec. The new InfoSec is, hmm, so that's what you want to do? OK, what can I do to help you? Can I give you a helmet? Uh, can, can, we, can we work on this a little more and see if there's something we can put, like a firewall between you and that, that explosive fuel tank on your back? You know, What can we do to help you do this crazy thing that you want to do? That's what we have to do in InfoSec. But this is a, a, perfect, a perfect example of risk management. There's so many things that are going on in that photo, which just depending on your point of view, right, 
puts you in a space of this is good or this is bad. How many people actually want to do it? Oh, yeah, all right. <laughs> I'm not one of those. Now consider this. So we're talking about decision making. This is the crew of the Space Shuttle Columbia. In 2003, the Space Shuttle Columbia, upon re-entry, disintegrated and all hands were lost. Here's the thing that not a lot of people know. NASA knew this was going to happen. So when the shuttle went up, it lost some, some heat tiles from the bottom of the shuttle. And those heat tiles were responsible for basically distributing the heat when the shuttle came back in re-entry. And the tiles are not that big. They're only 16 inches by 16 inches. And there's, you know, thousands of them on the bottom of this, the, the, the shuttle. And even the loss of a few of them compromised the ability for the shuttle to dissipate heat. And when they went up, NASA was doing some recon and they found tiles were missing from the bottom of the shuttle. Here's the decision they made. They never told the astronauts. Never told them. So, you have to consider to yourself, is this a good decision or a bad decision? On the one hand, we can tell them, if you come back, when you come back, you are doomed. Or, you can not tell them and have them presume everything is fine and be happy until the ends of their lives. These are the same kinds of things we face today. And this is a dramatic example, but it's a real example. Maybe you work in healthcare. Maybe what you do affects patient care. Maybe this is a real scenario for you. And the question is, do you inform or not? Now, I'm always an advocate of informing, but if I was one of these people, I don't know how I'd feel about it. I don't know if I'd want you to tell me or not. I'm not sure. But it's an interesting conundrum. Good decision or bad decision? I don't know. And then how do you defend it? NASA defended it. And they basically said, the flight director took the decision not to tell the astronauts because they did not want them to put them in a heightened state of emotional despair. Valid, right? Certainly valid reason. Interesting. So a non-exhaustive list of making good decisions, again, from my friend who wrote the UX design. Include relevant people in decision-making meetings and conversations. Absolutely. Don't make decisions in a vacuum. That's crazy. We're stronger together than we are apart. Right? And, and because we work in InfoSec and it's an us versus them kind of mentality, us is stronger when there's more us. So involve people. Know who the relevant people are. Yeah, don't involve people who don't want to be there or who don't matter. Right? You don't have to invite every single person in your company to every meeting that you have. But find out who your stakeholders are right? and get them involved. Note the exceptions. For instance, if your product manager gets his or her way with something you disagree with, make a note of it in your work journal. Challenge it. But as you can see, what he's saying here is write it down. Right? Write it down and say, all right, this was something that was not cool. Keep a work journal. Right? Do it. Keep a work journal. When things happen that are weird, get it in writing. I always say to people, get it in writing. Like if there's email exchanges, I mean, in the business that I'm in, when I deal with clients, I absolutely have to. Because there's actually, you know, liabilities and things if we execute the, the statement of work differently than what was actually proposed. So I'll have to always use written communications to do this. But it's a good practice in general, even internally. Get an email. If somebody promises you something, have them write it down for you. Research pattern, patterns and existing solutions. Be informed of what's come before. That's that whole look to the past to prepare for the future. Right? It's a great way to make decisions. Design in the right order. Start on a whiteboard or paper. Man, I love drawing stuff out on whiteboards. I love it. And it's where I start with everything. I have whiteboards all around my house. I have paper all around my house. I'm constantly doing this because visually, I'm trying to imagine what does this thing look like. And visualization helps. Remember we talked about storytelling? Visuals and storytelling are huge. How many people would prefer to read a picture book than read a book with a bunch of words? Right? We're trained like that from early age that those visuals matter. Um, make your mock-ups clickable and share these with the team and potential users. Basically what they're saying is if, you, if there's a way for you to demonstrate what it is you're going to do, demonstrate it. Right? Do that. That's a good thing. So we can learn a lot from the world of UX design, a world that I have nothing to do with, could, don't understand, and couldn't do if my, my life depended on it. But it's very interesting lessons that we can take over to what we do and go, yeah, that makes sense. Right? Let me give you a demo. What is threat modeling? It's demonstrating the attack path. It's a good practice, and we should do it more often. Here's what I want to tell you about. This is the most amazing thing I think I've ever read when it comes to decision making. Anybody know who this is? It's Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos is the CEO of Amazon. Amazon has a decision-making philosophy. It's called disagree but commit. Here's how it works. 
Let's say we're in a meeting, and there's several of us in the meeting, and I propose an idea in the meeting, and you agree, and you agree, and you agree, but you don't. So we talk about it. After 15 minutes, that's what we're allowed. At that point, if I still agree, you still agree, you still agree, you still agree, and you don't, what you say is, I disagree, but I commit. Which basically means, I don't think this is going to work, but I have enough trust and faith in you to make it happen. I'm putting my faith and trust in you. This takes a very high emotional intelligence. It takes a very good culture of trust to make happen. But I guarantee, if you can do this, your decision-making ability will improve significantly. You will get things done. Amazon is the pattern. We look to the past to plan for the future. Look at what they've been able to do with disagree but commit. This goes all the way up to Jeff Bezos. There were lines of business that were proposed. Um, remember, when Amazon was, was early on, they were just selling books, right? That's all they did. And there were lines of business that were pro proposed, and Jeff Bezos said, I don't think that's going to work. I disagree, but I commit. And he let his product managers pursue those lines of business. Whether they were successful or not was up to that team or that person. That's an amazing way to make decisions. 15 minutes is all you get, and then we move on. Right? If you can promote this in your culture, if you can get to this point where you say that, and you are emotionally ready to disagree but let somebody do something that's against what you agree with, you will be successful. Your decision-making abilities will improve, and, and I guarantee um, you'll be happy. That's all I have for you. So I hope that you can go out, that you can make better decisions. I hope that you can understand where decisions are coming from. I hope you're able to defend, to justify, to exploit opportunity. And I hope, I really hope, that one day you can disagree but commit. Thank you very much.